Hey everyone, in this lecture we're going to talk about digital multimedia and specifically digital photography. And we've talked a little bit about the importance of having a visual literacy because we process images so much faster than we do text. Um, and I think as we think about our media world today, most websites we visit are very image driven and most social media sites elevate content that it has high quality images in it. And if we think about the marketplace right now, um, as you go out and look for jobs, more and more media professionals are not just asked to write the story or code the website or build an ad campaign, but actually taking photos themselves. And wearing many hats is more and more becoming uh, a norm for most media professionals. So learning some of the basics and, and terms and concepts that go behind that, I think are very important as well as understanding some of the mechanical skills that go along with it too. So we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of digital photography today and uh, hopefully it'll build on some of the foundational skills that you probably already have as a digital native. Um, you've probably heard this phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I know I love reading books and I love writing stories and I love it when an author can explain uh, and draw a word picture of how something looks. Uh, but at the same time, there comes a point where you need to show someone rather than tell them. And so we have to ask the question, are we using a thousand words where a picture should be? Sometimes it's more important to show someone than it is to explain it to them. And that's the power of photography. And photography is different from video because you get a moment in time rather than the actual footage of the event. And so there are a lot of really great ways to tell stories using photos. Um, and more and more people are integrating photos within their multimedia packages. Uh, and so they have some text, some video, some interactives, and probably some photos that go with it. So first we're gonna talk about taking photos. Um, and there's two main categories when you're taking photos with a camera. You have a point and shoot option or a DSLR. Point and shoots are consumer level cameras where the lens and the flash are kind of built in. They are more compact, they're easy to use, um, they're more affordable, there's a lot of um, automatic options on this. Uh, and they, but they don't give you a lot of options because they want it to be consumer friendly. I would consider even our smartphones to be uh, point and shoot level of cameras. Now DSLRs are basically digital single lens reflex cameras. You get much higher quality images from these because you have a lot more manual controls that you can uh, control. And so they cost a lot more, but you get a lot of high quality images from it. Lenses are bought separately. You can buy lots of different accessories for them and upgrade them in different ways. Um, and, but they also provide really strong video modes and a lot of videographers use DSLRs as well. Um, and so these are the two main categories. One's generally more consumer level and the other one is more professional. And no matter what you're using to take photos, whether it's point and shoot or DSLR, there's three major components to um, exposure that we're gonna talk about today. It's called the exposure triangle. Um, there's three main settings that we have to be aware of when we're taking photos. There's the ISO, the shutter speed, and aperture. And each of these settings work together to build the best possible exposure for the photo that you're taking. And we're going to talk about each of those really quickly right now. So the first one we're going to talk about is ISO. ISO relates to the sensitivity of the light sensor that's actually in your camera. Now with film cameras, this is relating to the sensitivity of the film itself. So different film is made with different sensitivities. Kind of like different people have different sensitivities to light with their own eyes. So think of ISO as the amount of sensitivity that you have to light. Now with ISO, it's measured in hundreds. So um, a low ISO would be considered 200. If you're in a light daylight setting and there's a lot of light happening, then you're gonna want a very low ISO. Uh, but if you go into a setting that has some darkness in it, like this barn, you're gonna wanna increase the ISO and make your sensor be a little bit more sensitive to the light. So the lower the ISO, it's better for bright days, and then the higher ISO is meant for darker situations. Uh, you can see that at work here on this day, on this um, cloudy day, where you've got an ISO of 100 is going to be really low sensitivity and it's going to need that sensitivity over with ISO 1600 so that it can display more colors and, and appear a little bit brighter. 
So a really quick tip for ISO is start low and then go higher as needed. Start with a 200, 300, or 400, and then go from there and just increase it if you need it. And it really is um, you know, an experiment of trial and error. The next thing beyond ISO is shutter speed. Shutter speed allows light in by opening and closing a shutter. And with film cameras, the shutter is protecting the film from being exposed at all. When that shutter opens really quickly, it's allowing light in for that millisecond so that that film can be exposed. Now, the faster that shutter opens and closes, the less light it's allowing in. And that can be good and bad depending on how much light is out there anyway. So if you're on a bright sunny day like this and you have some people jumping on a trampoline and you wanna quickly get a shot of you know a moment in time where you, know, you have every detail of their hair, or you have the expression on their face, you can open and close that shutter very quickly. So one one thousandth of a second is very, very fast. And so you can see this photographer was in a bright day, probably using a mid-grade ISO of like maybe 400. And when you use, when you have enough light anyway, uh, the, the, the one one thousandth of a second when it allows that light in, it can allow for a lot of detail. But also if you expose that film for a little bit longer, you can provide some blur to your photos, which could be good or bad. Um, because the shutter is open for a little bit longer, quite a bit longer, in 1 60th of a second, um, you can see that there's some blur in the background, which adds some motion to the shot. So depending on the lighting and also the motion that you're trying to shoot, um, you would change your shutter speed based on both of those options. And then the third thing you have to think about is aperture. Aperture is the size of the hole in the actual lens. And the bigger that hole is, the more light that will be allowed in. And the smaller it is, you won't let as much light in. And so you can think of it kind of like your pupil. When it's really dark, your, your pupils are really large trying to let as much light in so that you can kind of see a little bit in the dark. But if it's a bright sunny day, your pupils are gonna be really small because it's not gonna want that much light in because it has enough. And so the aperture setting is kind of like how much light is being let in to um, the device. So aperture is measured in what they call f-stops. Um, f-stops are measured as fractions. And so when we see this f-stop of 2.8, it's actually pretty big. That's what this big white circle is. Uh, think of it as not being 2.8 of an f-stop, but one over 2.8. So it's about one third, which is 0.333, which is quite large compared to an f-stop of 22, which seems like it would be bigger, but one twenty-second is a lot smaller than one third. Um, so one sixteenth, one eleventh, one eighth, so actually the smaller the f-stop, the bigger the hole. So f-stops that are larger in number are actually smaller in size, if you wanna think about it that way. So it might be f-stop of eight is about a mid-grade, an f-stop of four is really one-fourth. Uh, an f-stop of 22 is one twenty-second. So these three um, settings really work hand in hand. So if it's a nice bright sunny day, you're gonna want a mid-grade ISO, even somewhat of a low ISO with somewhat of a fast shutter speed, and then you can measure how much of the aperture you want to be open. You can even do things like depth of field um, with aperture, and these all work in tandem together. So um, it's not a one size fits all, it's not necessarily even a formula, but these three settings work hand in hand so that you can provide the best possible exposure. You're gonna see these settings a lot in DSLR cameras, and sometimes if you download certain apps, you might see these words. And so you can kind of understand what they mean a little bit um, here within um, this little demonstration. Now, besides the hardware settings and actually setting the manual settings for your camera, there's some other considerations that we have to be aware of. The first is lighting. It's important to make sure that you're in a well-lit place um, and that your lighting is of good quality because if your lighting is low, then you're not gonna really be able to make out what's, what the subject is that you're trying to provide. So lighting is always a concern. So the best advice to give is that outdoor lighting is usually best. Uh, the sun provides great light, it provides a well-balanced white light, and so that's always the best setting for lighting. But if it's an overcast day, then that's usually a photographer's dream because it's 
uh, well lit, but it's not overexposed. And so you get the cloud covering. Um, and so the big tip on lighting is always to do it outside as much as possible. And then if you can get into some shade or overcast day, then you'll be great. Uh, the next thing to talk about is composition. Um, and so you have to think of yourself as a tour guide for your audience's eyes. Where are they looking? Um, and so before you take the shot, you have to think, what are you trying to guide their eye to? And one of the best ways to compose a shot is using what's called the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is basically when you take your shot and you turn it into a grid, a tic-tac-toe board. The idea is that our eyes are drawn to these uh, crosshairs of the tic-tac-toe board. So in this case, the lighthouse is in the upper left um, portion of this shot, and so our eyes are pleased with that. You might notice the rule of thirds if you ever watch a broadcast, and you'll notice that the, the anchor has his or her eyes at the upper third. Um, or in most interviews that you see, you, they try to make sure that the upper third is where the eye level is. So you might see this quite a bit. There are other ways to compose a shot. One is through symmetry. You might want to get a very well-balanced shot by um, you know, getting right in the center of a subject and allowing the user to see right down to the center of it um, to the focal point that's in the middle. And so um, symmetry is another way to compose a shot. There's no right answer to composition, but you have to be thinking of this as you're taking the photo so that you can really guide your user's eye to what you want them to see. Uh, the next thing to think about is time. You can't just go out and take a few shots and expect it to come out perfectly. You really have to take time and patience to sit. You may take 100 shots and only use one of them. You may take 200 shots and not use any of them. And so you can imagine when you're sitting and taking uh, this shot of the lightning hitting uh, this tree. Think how long that photographer had to wait before that shot happened. And then last, uh, you have to think of a variety of shots. Don't just take a wide shot every time. Get close-ups, get medium shots, get unique angles. Uh, try to frame your, your subject in a unique way. Use leading lines that are around you. The wider variety of shots that you take while you're actually taking the photos, the more you'll have to choose from later to tell your story. So really experiment with different types of shots as well. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about once you have the shots, how to edit and optimize them. Um, for the medium that you're you're putting it on